Welcome to session two of uh, the P3 class, Prophets, the Prophetic and the Prophecies. And so excited that you've joined us here for this new module. <clears throat> Just want to give a couple of greetings to uh, some of our pastors. And uh, we'll start with Pastor Eric there in Mombasa. Uh, welcome. And so pleased and proud of, uh, of you and all that you're doing there with Omega Mombasa. Pastor Doreen at Chimichimi Church, uh, how we love you. And uh, we can't wait to, uh, to see both of you guys again and your congregations and looking forward to that time when God would reunite us. And uh, Pastor Bopani over in uh, Omega Mombasa, or excuse me, Omega Mumbai, and uh, the 60 plus churches that you have there in the fellowship. Um, greetings to you and to your church. We are praying for you. Uh, we know that uh, COVID has hit your area hard and we are lifting you up and lifting your pastors up and pray uh, for safety, protection, and healing uh, upon, uh, upon the body that is there, letting it be a testimony uh, to all of those in the area of the power of God to save and the power of God to rescue uh, our bodies as well. And then uh, Pastor uh, uh, Kofi over there in the Ivory Coast, uh, cannot wait to see you in person, sir. Uh, praising the Lord for Him putting us together. And then, of course, the uh, original there in Santa Rosa, Omega uh, Santa Rosa. Uh, greetings to you as well and uh, how we love you and uh, are praying for you and uh, Pastor Forrest uh, there as well. And then, of course, uh, who knows, there may be a future uh, uh, Omega coming up in uh, Omega Albuquerque or something of that nature and Pastor, uh, Pastor William. But... Uh, uh, you know, who knows? I'm, I'm probably calling him out here on the, on the broadcast and he's like, what? I can't believe he said, said that. Anyway, greetings to all of you who are watching. We love you <clears throat> and we're looking forward to this session. Let's pray and uh, we'll get into the Word of God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. And anoint me to speak your words and your words only. And anoint everyone to hear exactly what it is that you would speak to their heart. And I do ask, Spirit of the Lord, that in this last generation, you would speak to our hearts and that you would change our lives. In your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Before we start the video, for all of those that are gathered here in the, uh, in the house for the in-person service, we go over the prior week's homework. And so for those of you who are watching online, uh, I want to update you on a couple of exciting things. Um, in the coming weeks, we are going to be announcing an app that you can download from the Google Play Store or from um, uh, the Apple Store. And on the app, it's not only going to have a way to watch the broadcast on your mobile phones, but it is going to have the way for you to also download the homework and all of the fact sheets that go with each lesson so that you can have the complete experience. They'll be there in PDFs. Uh, plus on the app, you can start and stop and start and stop and remember exactly where you were. And it's just going to be a, a better experience for you uh, in, in paying attention to these classes. So uh, you can download the whole thing at once if you're going by an internet cafe and it not take all your airtime. So lots and lots of benefits to that for you. We praise the Lord for the opportunity uh, to do that. In addition, we have a website that has gone live. Uh, but bear with us as we are updating content to match Omega. Uh, you can find us uh, at omegatexas.church, omegatexas.church, and uh, in addition then to Facebook and to our YouTube channel. We want to get the message of the Lord out <clears throat> in as many different ways as possible. So we're inviting you tonight to take this broadcast and please like it. Please share it on your feeds on Facebook and on YouTube. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And let's get the Word of God out for how we can equip individuals uh, to a biblically balanced life of, uh, of what the Bible says about the prophecies and the prophetic <clears throat> and the prophets. So I want to begin uh, this session with a statement. The prophets teach us that God is preoccupied with humankind or with mankind. <clears throat> the prophetic word of the original testament comprises roughly the same amount of words as the entire New Testament. God is serious about prophecy. So much of the word of God is devoted to prophecy. 
Why is this important to us? It's important for us to realize no matter what country you live in, no matter what government you live under, no matter what the conditions of your life, economically, educationally, no matter what hardships you're going through, it is important for you to understand that God knows where you are. He understands the weight and the burden of the life that you live. And he has a great deal to say about how to exist in that life and how to walk through that life and still glorify Jesus and give him honor. God is not indifferent about your plight or your struggle. The words of the prophets tell us that no matter how difficult things are, and as we look through this life, you need to understand Jesus is returning. He could come back at any day. And we live inside of a world that is woefully unprepared for his return. Sin is everywhere. And now governments and even churches are condoning sin. They are saying things that used to be wrong are now right and pleasing in the eyes of God. They're saying it is okay to live with one another. They're saying lives that are immoral are okay. They're saying that lives of lying and cheating and slander are permissible in the sight of God. The church has a problem. And yet in all of those problems, not just in the church, but in the countries and the communities that we live in, sometimes we begin to feel that maybe God is indifferent about this, that maybe God doesn't care about the plight. The prophets are proof to us that God looks at the injustices in society. He looks at the cheating that goes on and the, and the people taking advantage of one another. And he has some very strong words of condemnation. He would raise up the prophets to say, you cannot keep your neighbors in indentured servitude. That is wrong. It is wrong to withhold their wages. It, it is wrong to weigh out a false balance with them and charge them more uh, than, than what the going rate is. He had all kinds of things that the prophets were used to address the day-to-day -day misfortunes of the life of Israel. That is important to us because we see that God is not indifferent towards them. He, neither is He indifferent towards your condition and towards your plight. We can learn and we can be strengthened and we can receive encouragement and consolation from the words of God to those hearers and those believers in the original Testament as well as in our lives today. God is not resigned to the destruction of this world nor of humankind. He is not wrapped up in running the universe in some distant galaxy and, uh, uh, and, and so he doesn't care about what happens to you. We see in the prophets that God is earnestly pleading his righteous cause with us puny humans. Generation after generation, God lays out the exact same arguments for them that he's laid out for us today, saying, if you will but turn and humble yourselves and repent of your evil behavior, if you will but just go before me and ask for forgiveness and ask for a new heart, then I will save you. I will rescue you from your current uh, situation. I will, uh, I will get rid of the drought. I will get rid of the invading armies. I, I will call the nation back to myself and I'll raise them up and I'll, I'll give them a hope and I'll give them a future and I'll give them a glory. You see, in the prophets, we understand that far from being indifferent towards the plight of humankind, God is for, uh, saddened. He is saddened, excuse me, when he is forsaken by man. You see God deeply affected by the backslidden nature of his people. He's deeply affected by the apostasy of the church in this generation. A church that has exchanged the beauty of mercy and the beauty of grace. He's exchanged that in this generation for, for just live how you want and there's grace and God will take care of you. And they, they've taken the death and the resurrection, the sacrifice of the Son of Jesus at the cost of the blood of God. They've taken it and so minimized it and trivialized it as if to say that it's okay to continue in that behavior and continue in that lifestyle that caused the Son of God to have to die to begin with. With Christ inside of us, the prophet wonders aloud, how can the people led by the Spirit of God be indifferent to the plight of those that are around us? 
You see, there are many different spectrums in the church. There are those that think they're okay when they're still living in sin. And then there are those in the church that say, I am okay and I'm doing right with God. To which the prophet would say, if you're doing right with God and you have the heart of God beating inside of you, then how can you look around at the society that's around you and how can you not be undone by it? How can you not weep for the broken? How can you not have your heart ripped in two for those that are lost around you in your community who are dying and they're on their way to an eternity in a lake? of fire. You see, God is not indifferent and he is trying to raise up individuals in his body today who will speak with that same voice of love and compassion and power and unyielding, uncompromising uh, attitude that would call the people of God and the creation of God back into fellowship and relationship with him. Abraham Heschel, one of the individuals that uh, I have used uh, there, his resources a great deal uh, in formulating this class. He says this, <clears throat> The prophet seldom tells a story, but casts events. He rarely sings, but he castigates. He does more than translate reality into a poetic key. He is a preacher whose purpose is not self-expression, or the purgation of emotions, but communication. His images must not shine, they must burn. The prophet is intent on intensifying responsibility, is impatient of excuse, contemptuous of pretense and self-pity. He is a polished arrow taken out of the quiver of God. This is one man's view of how God would use the prophets in the original Testament. And again, as he used them in the original Testament, it's the exact same way that he desires to use the prophets in our generation. Isaiah chapter 49 verse 2 uh, says this uh, to compliment, uh, well, Abraham Heschel's words actually compliment these words of Scripture. But it says this, Isaiah says, Coastlands, listen to me. Distant peoples, pay attention. The Lord called me before I was born. He named me while I was in my mother's womb. He made my words like a sharp sword. He hid me in the shadow of his hand. He made me like a sharpened arrow. He hid me in his quiver. You see, Isaiah is not just talking about these things to exalt himself or give himself self-importance. He is pleading with a generation that was lost, a generation that he lived in that had turned their back on God. They thought they were right with God. They would go to the temple and they would offer sacrifices. They would attend the feast. They kept the festivals. But all throughout the week, they were worried about their own gain. They were worried about the things that were right for them. They were worried about living their best life now, if you can say so such things. Uh, they were worried about their own ease and their own prosperity. Uh, and all of these things were ongoing. And yet Isaiah tells them to get your attention. God has hidden me. This is how much God loves you. He loves you enough that he raised me up. He called me before I was even born. He knew that you would need my voice in your generation. And he gave me the words from his throne on high to speak to you at this given moment, not because he doesn't care, not because he is indifferent, but just the opposite, because he wanted you to live and not die, because he wanted you to hear his passion and his love for you so that you could turn and be made right with him and have your sin forgiven and you could have life over overwhelming inside of you instead of a certain death. He made me that polished, sharpened arrow in his quiver that the God would take back and let it find its target in your heart. Why? Because often we won't change until we hurt. If things are going well inside of our lives and if we're prosperous and there is no rejection and there is no difficulty and all of our prayers are answered and it's a, a laugh every day and, and all of our bills are paid and, and everybody likes us and then uh, oftentimes at our ease we can't handle the prosperity that God gives us and so he slowly tightens the, uh, the pressure around us so that we will recognize that something is wrong and he allows our heart to have that dissatisfaction on the 
inside so that we will begin to lift up our voices and call out to him. You see, that's the polished arrow, the arrow hidden in the quiver of God where Isaiah would speak the word and Jeremiah would speak the word and it would penetrate to the core of the heart. It would undo the self-reliance and the self-security that the individual had. It would expose the wickedness and cause them to cry out to the Lord, what must I do to be saved? These are the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost when he stands in front of the crowd of individuals that is gathered there who have just witnessed an outpouring of the Spirit of God and they're seeing such a spectacular display, display of the move of God upon the hearts and the people's lives to such an extent that people said, what, what, what does this mean? These people seem like they're drunk. I mean, they're so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God, they must not have been able to stand. They, they must have been laughing. They must have been a joyous, raucous bunch there in the temple that day. And these people are saying, oh, these men are drunk, Peter stands up and says, they are not drunk. It's just the, the third hour of the day. It's just the morning. It's nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, prophesied uh, uh, hundreds of years prior to this day. And he begins then to preach a sermon. You see, Peter was on that day, a sharpened, a polished, sharpened arrow of the Lord to strike right into the hearts. He wasn't there to say, don't worry about what you did to Jesus 50 days ago. Oh, it's all under the blood now. There's great Grace for what happens. You see, he did not lessen their responsibility. He intensified their responsibility until they cried out and ripped their clothes and said, what must I do to be saved? That's the prophet. I've told you before that it was Finney that in his uh, days of preaching, he said he would never speak to a person about the, the salvation message and how they could get relief until he could no longer see their eyes. He was worried about false conversions. He was worried about individuals trying to accept Christ for the good in it without owning the sin that was on the inside. Worried that someone wouldn't fully repent of the sin that weighed them down. And so he waited until their heads slowly sunk and their hearts sunk. And then when they could no longer see them at eye level, he knew that something had gripped their hearts heart and he would begin to say, but Jesus came and he lived and he died on your behalf because he loves you, because he did not want to leave you in that condition that you're in, because he had hope for your life of something better for you. And then he would preach them out of their despair and preach them out of their heaviness and discouragement. And he would show them how to relieve the burden and the weight of sin that had plagued them their entire lives. You see, the prophets were not there for entertainment purposes. The ease of their audience's emotions was not of primary, nor was it of secondary concern. In many of our churches across the world today, their entire purpose is to cause people to feel at ease where they are so that they will come back next week and feel at ease where they are so they will come back the next week and they will give in the offering and they'll be happy and they'll tell them that they're living a good life and they'll tell them that God loves them and they'll tell them that God has the utmost hopes and dreams for them. All the while they've got sin in their life. All the while there's iniquity. All the while they haven't changed one bit of their behavior. Their time still goes where it used to. Their money still goes where it used to. Their behaviors still go where it used to. See, the church are lulling people into a false sense of security. We need the prophetic voice to begin to rise, not just in the pulpit, but in the congregation, in the men's groups, in the women's groups, in the youth, and in, uh, in the children's church. We, we, we need it in the, in the outreach ministries. We, we need the prophetic voice to come alive in the body of Christ that would begin to call people into account with being made right with God. You see, ease of emotions is not the primary or secondary concern. Ease of emotions is the peace that comes after a soul is made right with God. Before a soul is made right with God on God's terms, there is no peace. The prophets were definitely not interested in being politically correct. They weren't interested in saying what others said. In fact, they often said the things that they had to say at great personal cost. They were interested in communicating the heart of God and they felt an Im impending deadline, no pun intended with the term deadline, to persuade their audience that their audience needed to make a decision to serve and follow God before their time ran out, and that no one had a guarantee of when their time was going to run out. 
observe the behavior of Jesus. What was it about his behavior that both persuaded many to follow him and many to not rest until he was killed? How can one man say the same thing and one audience hears it and they cannot rest until they follow him and one audience hears it and says off with his head and to the cross with him? That was the life of Jesus and that was the life of a follower of Jesus and that is the life of a prophet. You see, how else do you awaken those who are asleep except sound the alarm? Jesus was the ultimate polished, sharpened arrow, exposing hypocrisy, exposing spiritual pride of the religious elite, driving off the demonic spirits who are harassing the people of God and providing comfort and hope and healing to those whose hearts were crying out for rescue, strengthening those who are weak. You see, the prophetic voice is needed in the body of Christ today. The only way to awaken those that are asleep is to sound the alarm. What else can you do to hearts of stone except bringing the hammer of the word of God in thunderous love? You see, while others are consumed with today and consumed with tomorrow, the prophets are consumed with the akharit. The akharit is a Hebrew word that means the end or what follows after. And to the prophets, they would always say, sure, you feel at ease in your sin now, but what next? Sure, you feel like it's okay to get ahead in business now, but what next? Sure, you feel like it's okay to reject God now, but what next? Sure, you feel like it's okay to reject Him and forsake Him and do your own thing and run your own life right now, doing what seems right in your eyes. Sure, that seems to be like it's working out for you, but what next? And what next? And what next? Until the ultimate what next is. When you stand before Jesus and have to give an account of your life, what next? What answer will you give when you've heard the prophet's words and you rejected them? What answer will you give when you've read the word of God and you've rejected it? What answer will you give if called upon to give an account for your behavior, for your ministry, pastors, for the people in your congregation, for how well you treated them, for how well you enabled them to live the life that God has called them to live under your tutelage. If you have to give an account right now, this very second, how well would you do? Abraham Heschel says again, the prophet is human, yet he employs notes one octave too high for our ears. He experiences moments that defy our understanding. He is neither a singing saint nor a moralizing poet, but an assaulter of the mind. Often his words begin to burn where conscience ends. You see, to a world that's grown deaf to meaning, to a world that has grown numb to the conviction of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. The prophet stood as an individual who would thunder the words of God to anyone who had ears to hear and would penetrate through that wall and that barrier of security that made the individual feel like they were well when the reality is they were destined for a lake of fire. But why the prophetic words? You see, some people see and they hear the prophetic and they say it's scary, it's, it's, a, it's final, it's judgment, it's harsh, it's all of these things. Let me, let me say a different side of that to you. In everything that has to do with the prophetic, you're going to see that the motivation and the underlying principle behind all of it is the love and the compassion of God. The only reason for Him to speak is because he is concerned about the plight of his creation. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he gradually ramps up the pressure and he gradually sends a stronger and a stronger message, not because he has got his arms folded and says, I'm refusing to move and I'm refusing to act and they're getting what they deserve and I'm laughing at them because they're struggling because they've forsaken me. That is not at all the heart of God, nor was it the heart of the prophets 
The heart of God is saying, maybe I'll send this next voice. And though they kill that voice, I'll raise up and send another voice. And though they kill that voice and mistreat that one and shun that one and ostracize the next one, I'll send another voice and I'll send another voice. Why? Because of his great love for you, because of his great love for his creation and his people, not willing that any would ever slip into eternity without an opportunity to get right with him. It is all the love and it is all the compassion of God. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 23 gives us an insight in the middle of the book of Ezekiel, an insight into the heart of God inside the prophetic stream. In Ezekiel it says, Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? This is the declaration of the Lord God. This is what you can count on from the Lord God. Instead, Don't I take pleasure when he turns from his ways and lives? You see, this is God. He's saying the entire reason that I'm sending Ezekiel, the entire reason we have the entire book of Ezekiel is not because I'm indifferent and not because I don't care and not because my arms are folded and saying, take that and take that and take that. It's not because of that. It's because he is hoping that some ears somewhere will listen and some hearts somewhere will listen and turn and be rescued. He discloses the future not to frighten nor to threaten, but out of love to turn these hearts from impending disaster. In Luke chapter 15, we see it this way. When we are told the parable of three things that are lost, you have the lost sheep, which was lost by wandering off. It didn't mean to get lost. But it was lost just the same. And yet the father or the shepherd left the 99 and went and rescued the one that was lost and carried it home so that everything could be safe again. That's the heart of the father in compassion. You see, it's the same heart of the prophet. Then you have the second parable of the thing that was lost. And this item was lost by neglect. The woman had 10 precious coins and one of those 10 was lost. And so she swept the house and lit a candle and she couldn't rest until it was recovered. So it says when something is, is lost by neglect in the kingdom, that is the God of, that loves our souls, the God that sent his very own son to die for us and the power and the person of his spirit to try and reach out and reconcile us to him again. It's that same God that's there saying, I've lit the candle, the light of the world, and I'm rescuing those things that are lost. I'm rescuing those things that have been lost, even though it was lost by neglect. And then many of us are all too familiar with the parable of the prodigal son. This wasn't lost by wandering off. And this wasn't lost by neglect. But this was willful disobedience, willful rejection of God, willful having the things of God and having the things of the Father and being given the gifts and the tools of the kingdom and saying, I'm going to take them and squander them, spending them on myself. See, there's a note here. Anything of the blessing and the nature and the power of God, any of the giftings of God that end in self instead of glorifying those that are around you are not uh, being motivated, motivated by the love of God, but being motivated by the force of darkness and evil and yet in all three of those examples we see the father rejoicing we see the individuals rejoicing we see all of heaven rejoicing when those things that are lost come back home again no matter what state they were in no matter the depravity that we're in no matter if they wandered off or if they wandered off on their own or wandered off because of neglect God still rejoices and delights in taking those things that are broken and those things that are lost and those things that are hindered and bringing them back into his kingdom this is also the same love that urged Noah to provide an ark for his safety to carry him above the judgment that was to come you see the name Noah means rest and God was going to provide him a rest but it's important to understand that what he built was a prophetic vessel there was no such thing as an ark prior to Noah building it There was no such thing as a flood, nor any such thing as rain prior to Noah building it. And yet God deposited the pattern inside of Noah. God gave Noah the ability to build this ark. God gave him the strength and the stamina to build this ark. And such as building it, he was a preacher of righteousness inside of his generation. The prophetic vessel, when built, it was covered with pitch inside and out. Now look at the other ark, the ark of the covenant. 
God gave the design to Moses. God enabled a person to build it, gave the craftsman the skill to do it by enduing him with power from the Holy Spirit. He put a cover on it. You see, the same word cover is the same word used there for pitching the ark or covering the ark with pitch. The significance is there's atonement at the ark of the covenant and there is rescue from the judgment of God through the ark of Noah that rose it above the waters, whereas the ark of the covenant had the blood of God poured on it. You see, both of these were heavenly design, not human invention. Yet it was built by Noah, which indicates you have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's not something that God just hands and says, look, it's ready made. You already have it taken care of. There's nothing that you have to do. You have to process it. You have to build it. You have to act upon it. You have to live on it. The same with the Ark of the Covenant. The pitch kept the water out of the ark. God is going to judge. It just keeps us safe through it. With the Ark of the Covenant, it's the covering, the, the atonement seat. It's the saying saying, I will make you atoned or at one again with God. I'm going to restore you again through the blood. And God restored also uh, Noah through the Ark. The Ark was safety and rescue. It was designed by God, built by man. Salvation, repentance, mercy, love, forgiveness, all of these are designed by God, but they have to be built by the human heart. Above all of the prophet's words, above all of the judgment, above all of the disappointment, above all of the frustration, you'll find the mercy of God. When you listen to the words of the prophet, don't just hear the judgment. Hear the desperation of the voice of God promising the love of God, promising the mercy of God. You see, that's the only reason to speak the words of judgment is the hope that there would still be mercy. How many times will you now recall from reading the prophetic that you begin to read some of these passages and says, but if you will turn, then I will be eager. I will run to you. I will forgive your iniquities. Your sin I will remember no longer. I will raise you up. I will stop the plague. I will let the rains begin again. I will not let the drought overcome you. I will not let the pestilence overcome you. You see, God stands ever ready to rescue his people that come before him and repent. But how can we repent unless we've heard the words of God? Above the ark of Noah, you had the rainbow in the sky promising a new beginning, promising I will never again destroy humankind as I have today, promising a new covenant with Noah. And above the ark of the covenant, you have the angels' wings and the cherubim stretched from wall to wall, covered with the blood of God, promising that I am going to forgive your sins and your iniquities I will remember no longer. In this generation... As I've already mentioned, let me stress it. What we need are not fewer voices who are hearing from God inside of our assemblies, but we need more voices who are hearing from God. Moses put it this way, would that all God's people were prophets. Let me read to you a passage out of Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. He brought 70 men from the elders of the people and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord descended in the cloud and spoke to him. And he took some of the spirit that was on Moses and placed the spirit on the 70 elders. As the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they never did it again. Two men had remained in the camp, one named Eldad, the other Medad. The spirit rested on them. They were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses. There have been tattletales in every generation. Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, assistant to Moses since his youth, responded, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses asked him, are you jealous on my account? If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on them. Then Moses returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. Now there's a great many things that we could preach 
out of this passage a great many things that speak to us, but I want to concentrate on a couple of things here. Uh, the primary phrase being, would that all of God's people were prophets. Being prophets and prophetic and prophecy is not a New Testament phenomena. It is not just an original Testament phenomena. It is something that God has desired for his people, that they would hear his voice, that they would understand his voice speaking to their heart, and that they would act upon the things that God was speaking to them. That has always been the desire of God from Adam all the way through Revelation, all the way through today. You see the scope of work that needs to be done in this generation on the face of the earth requires more spirit-filled leaders, not less. Moses couldn't maintain his current congregation. Let me pause here and I need to say a word or two to the pastors that are, 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 are there being a part of this session. You need not be afraid of the prophetic in your church. In fact, let me go a step further. You do not need to be afraid of God enabling and gifting individuals with ministry inside of your church. The fear is, oh, I'm going to have someone come in and they're going to preach better than me or they're going to speak better than me or someone's going to like them better than me. Let me see. Let me tell you this. You control them at your own risk. If you control them, you'll drive them away and you'll drive half of your people away with them. But first of all, let me back up and say something else. They are not your people to begin with. The people of God are attending different local bodies all over this world, but they are God's people. Pastors, you are responsible to raise them up. You are responsible to hear from God on their behalf and to help equip them with the callings and the giftings that they have in the body of Christ, whether it be a calling for prophecy or whether it be a calling for praise or whether it be a calling for intercession or a calling for teaching or a calling for pastoral ministry or a calling for evangelism, a calling for whatever it may be. It is the responsibility of the pastor as the overseer of the local body to enable these people people that have come to you to gift the, the giftings of the Lord to be realized inside of them that you would give them every tool at your disposal that you would give them every bit of encouragement at your disposal and instead of trying to keep what you think belongs to you that you would begin to look at the kingdom and the body of Christ as what belongs to God you see I am going to be judged not by how many people I kept around me but I'm going to be judged by what I did with those that God surrounded me or with whom God surrounded me with some of the greatest joys in my ministry have been in seeing individuals raised up to fulfill the ministry that God has called them to in this generation and watch them turn loose for the glory of God you see I have a share in their victories when I stand before Christ in heaven, he's going to be able to point to a multitude of individuals that have successful ministries and that have done great things for the Lord. And I'm going to say, I help them. I have a little sliver in that. I, I encourage them on a certain day. I gave them an opportunity to speak. I, I let them uh, uh, preach to our congregation. I, I provided them with offerings of support. I provided them with prayer support. I, I encouraged them in front of the saints so that the saints would see that they were approved of by me and approved of by you. I had a hand in what you were doing inside of their life. You see, bottom line, bottom line, God has surrounded us with individuals not so that we could spend it on ourselves, but he surrounded us with individuals so that we could populate the kingdom. I have always desired to surround myself with people who were better than me with people who could preach better than me, speak better than me, evangelize better than me, praise better than me. Praise the Lord for that. I have always wanted to see the best that are around. I feel like that makes the local body stronger, number one. Uh, but number two, people say, oh, aren't you insecure? Aren't you afraid that maybe somebody's going to do this and somebody's going to do that? Uh, no, no, the, uh, glory to God. I want the children that God has brought around me. I want them to surpass me. Is that not what a father does with his own household? When you look at your children, are you afraid that they'll be smarter than you? No, you hope they'll be smarter than you. Do you look with disdain if they break your records in athletics? No, you're proud and you 
break your records. You say, that's, the, that's my boy. That, that, that's my DNA that's there. You get excited when they have victories. You weep with them when they have tragedies and difficulties and you hold them through it. You educate them to think and to reason and to hear the voice of God and become what God has called them to be, knowing that they will only be satisfied in this life when they find that purpose of God and they fulfill it by the anointing and the power of God. That's the only time in their life they're going to feel peace. They're going to feel security and you rejoice and watching them on that journey and helping them find it and you hope they preach better than you you hope they pray better than you you hope they're more secure than you you hope they're better adjusted than you you hope they have a higher mountain of fruit than you you want them to do well why is it not the same in the body of Christ with pastors and those that are brought near their circle it's time we surround ourselves with more individuals who can hear from God not less it is time we surround ourselves with those uh, who are not threatened and we become individuals who are not threatened when others hear from God. Those who are not threatened with correction, those who are immersed in the balance provided with the intimacy uh, with God as its foundation. You see, th th this is, can you imagine a church operating and functioning the way it should without jealousy, without envy, without control, without fear, just simply the Spirit of God. In the New Testament, the book of Acts says this a, a dozen times. I may be speaking with a little bit of hyperbole there, but it says it over and over and over again. It seemed good to the Spirit of God. God, and so it was good to us. This becomes the mantra for the church. It should still be our mantra today. Let's get together. Let's pray. Someone has a word. Someone has a message. Let's get together in unity with the Spirit and let's all begin to hear from God and let the anointing of God come down and say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and so it's good to us. We're going to send Paul and Barnabas out. We're going to do this doctrine. We're going to settle on this here with the church. We're going to appoint seven elders to help the Greek widows that are being overlooked. You see, when, when the Spirit of God is allowed to be loose in the prophetic sense inside of the body, it makes the body stronger, not weaker. How can we disregard not just prophecy, but any gifting in the body that God said I want in the body? How can we say this one's necessary and this one is not? We have no right. May I submit to you that in my experience, most of the time, it's been insecurity, it's been fear, and it's been the realization that it's going to take a lot of work to raise up some of the elements of the spiritual and make them biblically balanced. But this is the work that we're called to. Is the answer then that we simply do away with it and that we don't hear the freshness of the voice of God and the vitality of the life of the Spirit in the midst of our congregations? Is the answer that because we're afraid of some flake that may come into the congregation and try and disturb us? Have we not the authority to tell that individual to sit down and let's learn and let's talk, but we encourage the giftings that go on here? I mean, have we not the ability to address these things? We have the ability. Do we have the courage? The scope of the work that needs to be done on the face of this earth requires more spirit-filled leaders, not fewer. Moses understood this. His father-in-law understood this. He says, you're wearing yourself out. You aren't going to be able to handle this workload. You've got six million people out here in the wilderness and most of them uh, on any given day want you dead. You need someone else to help you. Pastors, uh, can I get an amen? You need someone else to carry this weight for you. So the answer for God is always God's answer. His solution is always spirit-filled, spirit-led, spirit-driven people. God didn't say, oh yeah, just take a couple of people and throw them out there and let's just see what happens. He says, choose 70 men. And he took of the spirit, the same spirit that was on Moses, and he gave it to those 70 and they prophesied. See, God's solution is always spirit-led, spirit-filled, spirit-driven people. In the New Testament, when they have this problem with the widows who are being overlooked, who are of Greek ethnicity, what did they do? They prayed, they got together, and the solution was choose seven men full of the Holy Spirit of God. 
and set them in charge of the distribution of the money and of the food and of the income so that these widows are not going to be overlooked. That was the solution birthed by the Spirit, listened to by the church. It was a solution that had its root in prophecy. Prophetic, uh, prophetic uh, 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 voicing uh, from the Spirit of God into the, the lives of that New Testament church. This is what the church is supposed to be about. You see, there are pastors. Uh, some of them can handle five people in their congregations. Some of them can manage 100 people. Some of them can manage 200 people. A few can manage maybe 300 people. But there's nobody that can manage much more than that by yourself. This is sometimes why small churches stay small. But pastors, let me also tell you something. For those of you aspiring to say, I want a church of 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever, let me, under, let, let me let you understand something. Most of the pastors may not even realize this, but you will then be responsible for the souls of 10,000 or 20,000 or 50,000. And are you preparing them to stand before God without regret? Are you preparing them to stand before God having fulfilled their ministries? You see, that is an awesome responsibility. But regardless of whether God's called you to pastor a thousand or whether he's called you to pastor 20, you are called to your field and you are called to your village and you are called to your community and your city. And if those are the 50 people that God has given you and you're never going to get any more, so be it. That is God's business. But you are called to pour your life into them. You're called to pray for them. Them. You're called to see them enabled and empowered with the gifts of the Spirit so that they become the strongest 50, the strongest 20, the strongest 75 that that region has ever known. You are called to present them then before the Lord and say, see, I took what you gave me and I raised them up and I sent them out full of the anointing and the power of God. That is your mission. And your mission, when fulfilled, will carry the same reward as the mission of the person who's got 30000 people in his church if not higher because of the success rate with those that were entrusted with your care hear that pastors don't despise where you are don't despise the calling and the road that God has you on don't wish for something different when God says I've made you into this individual and 30 and 50 people this is all that I'm, I'm needing for yes the kingdom has got to grow and yes God is going to grow his kingdom but oftentimes it doesn't mean that you're growing you get 50 and then God takes 20 of them and uses it to plant another church and then you get 50 again and God takes 20 of them and you've raised up another pastor in another area of Mombasa or another area of Mumbai or another area of Gujarat, or another area of, of, of Nairobi. You see, you see what it is? You, you may not ever have the accumulation at your own house. But if you're constantly someone that develops people in the kingdom of God and releases them, and develops them and releases them, your name will be mentioned and remembered on that day in heaven when the rewards are handed out. See, the Holy Spirit of God is given by God in the original testament as well as the new. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is not an isolated phenomena meant to die out with the apostles after briefly appearing for a generation. The Spirit of God has always been filling people for service to God. David was filled with the Holy Spirit when he was anointed to be king. In Judges chapter 6, somewhere around verse 30, 34, 35, somewhere around in there, you have the Spirit of God coming upon Gideon. And it says as the Spirit of God came on him, the word means he put Gideon on like clothes and then said, let's go, Gideon. We've got work to do. He was wearing Gideon as if Gideon was a suit of armor, an exoskeleton. And he was on the inside saying, Gideon, with me wearing you, we're going to defeat the enemy and we're going to take down the strongholds and we're going to deliver. Israel from the bondage and from the oppression. This is the power of the Spirit of God when He clothes you or puts you on. It's the same in the original testament as it is in the New Testament. The elders in the days of Moses were prophesying and the Spirit rested upon them and they prophesied too. Joshua comes and tells Moses, everybody's concerned 
Oh, Moses, you got to stop this. This is disruptive. They didn't even come to the tent of meeting. They didn't do it the way you asked, Moses. Moses, you're not in charge. Nobody's ever going to listen to you again. If you let this go on, your integrity's shot. If you let this go on, your, your control's shot. And, and Moses' response to Joshua is a response we would do well to memorize. Are you jealous for my sake? You see not a jealous bone in Moses' body. Would that all of God's people were prophets. And Moses left the matter in the hands of God. You see, these are unique and unprecedented days. Why do I say that? Well, I'm not going to ask how many are at this session who were around before 1948. But in 1948, Israel became a nation. Most of the people alive on the face of the earth today do not remember Israel as anything but a nation. And so they don't see the prophetic imports of that. But for thousands of years, prophets have been saying that a nation that has not existed is going to be born. And that nation was going to be born in existence in one day. And it says nothing is too hard for God when people would even state to the prophets 2,000 years ago, that I, I can't believe that. That's, that's nothing like that's ever happened. You see, from 583 BCE and the time that Jerusalem fell, Jerusalem has not existed as a sovereign power. In the time of Jesus, they were occupying some of the territory known as Israel, known as Judea, but it was under Roman rulership. That's why Pontius Pilate was there as the governor of Rome. It was a Roman outpost there in Judea. And then the wall fell in Jerusalem in 72 AD and Jerusalem was burnt to the ground as was the temple burnt to the ground and the people of Jerusalem and the people of Israel were scattered throughout the world. There has not been a nation of Israel from those times until 1948. And in one day, a proclamation in a world body birthed a nation that had been out of existence for over two thousand years you need to understand that god's word is true and when he speaks something though you may think it tarries god counts on every word and fulfills it exactly as he said he was going to fulfill it why is that important why is that important to you and me because we are living in an era in which this prophecy is beginning to come true which god also equated with the latter days now yes the latter days have been around since the time of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but we are living in a generation that is seeing that fig tree begin to bud. It's seeing that nation of Israel come to life again. And there are people throughout the last several decades of Jewish descent that have been scattered in Russia, scattered in Iran, scattered in Iraq, scattered in the United States, scattered in Europe and countries throughout Europe and Russia, scattered through all these nations. And they felt a stirring to return to a land that they've never known, that their parents parents have never known, that their grandparents have never known, that no one in any generation as far back as they can remember have ever known. And they don't even know why they are returning to these nations. It is because prophecy is being fulfilled. God is doing it by his own power. God is doing it by his own strength. He does not need the help of any government. He does not need the help of the church. He does not need the help of anyone. He will fulfill his word. The prophets have spoken about these days, and therefore we must study what they have written and what they heard. The Bible indicates that in these days, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 5, and it says this, Now the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. Though the hypocrisy of liars, or through the hypocrisy of liars, whose consciences are seared, they forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods that God created to be received with gratitude by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing should be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, since it is sanctified by the word of God and with prayer. So a couple of things here to take note of. In the last days, doctrines of demons, seducing spirits. So we're talking to the church. We're not talking to the unchurched. It's saying that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. It means they were in the faith. They're going to turn their back on the faith. 
They were in. They were believers. They're going to turn their back. Why? Because they're going to pay attention to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. And then we're going to flip over to Jude. And Jude tells us some of that doctrine of demons or some of the things that the, 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 the darkness is teaching inside of the church, not the unchurched, inside of the church. It says exchanging the grace of God for licentiousness, basically denying the master who bought them. What is it saying? It's saying, oh, we want you, Jesus, as Savior. We want you to forgive our sin. We want you to send us to heaven and a new Jerusalem. That sounds fantastic to be in that golden city and walk on the street of gold and all of those things that go along with it. But don't tell me that you're a Lord. Don't tell me that you're my master. Don't tell me that you own me. Don't tell me I'm bought with a price and therefore I have to give my life to you, that I have to surrender to you. See, the Bible says that is a doctrine of deceit. That's a doctrine of antichrist if you will, these individuals in the church in the latter days are going to take the message of truth and instead have a false message of grace that says, I'll take you as savior, but I'll deny you as master. You're hard pressed not to turn on the television or watch the internet and find some pastor who is spouting that exact same doctrine that the Bible says is a doctrine of deceit and of seducing spirits, and is tearing away people of God from the true way of following after Him. Why do I say that? Because as we live in these interesting times, as prophecy begins to increase, so does deception begin to increase. Wherever God starts something that is genuine, the enemy always tries to raise something that's a counterfeit. So right now in our culture, you begin to see an increase in prophecy and you begin to see an increase in the prophetic. I'm telling you, we're going to walk through in this class to have some discernment and have some wits about you. And there's ways to test biblical prophecy. There's ways that we aren't just supposed to swallow everything at face value because someone calls themselves a prophet, but we're called to test the prophets. We're called to test the words to make sure that we're genuine. God is not afraid of the test. What he says he will do. If he doesn't say it, he's not going to do it. Do you understand? God's not nervous about it at all. Uh, the people that are nervous about it are those that don't want accountability for the things that they say. As prophecy increases, so will the abuses. You see, there are two extremes in the body. One is receive everything Believe everything that comes along, everything you read on the internet, everything you see in some service. Believe that everybody that calls themselves a prophet is a prophet simply because they call themselves that. That's believe everything, and that's damaging. That's not healthy for the body of Christ. The other extreme is to reject everything. I don't want to deal with it. Prophets are weird. Prophets are unpredictable people. Prophets usually want the attention on themselves, I think. And prophets might take part of my congregation away. Our prophet may do the, all the negatives. And so you say, I'm going to reject it. But again, those of you who want to follow after Christ, how can you reject something that Christ said he wanted as a part of his body? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 and 20. And let me say one other thing before we move on from there. For all those individuals who say, oh, I haven't rejected. I want it in my body. I just want the real stuff. Well, then create an atmosphere in which the real stuff can be there and create an atmosphere in which the real stuff can be presented by God and give people the opportunity to learn inside of the safety and security of that body. If you want it, God will provide it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. Timothy, my son. I am giving you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies previously made about you. Now, what if, what if Paul hadn't believed in prophecy? And what if Paul was trying to do away with prophecy? Then how in the world would Timothy have heard those prophecies and later needed to rely back on them when he was going through a particular time of struggle, when he was going through a spiritual battle and he felt like he was overwhelmed? How would he then turn back to those prophecies and use them to stand on knowing that he heard the word of God? I am telling you, every individual who has served God for any length of time, you have words that God has spoken to your heart that if it had not been for those words and it had not been for that 
that vision and it had not been for that dream and it had not been for that moment in prayer, you would be out of ministry, perhaps not even serving God anymore, but you were discouraged and you were being overwhelmed and you were being threatened and harassed by the enemy, yet you stood strong on that word that was spoken to you and you pushed back the rejection. You pushed back the darkness. You pushed back the voices of the enemy trying to defeat you and you said, no, it will be as my God has said and though I can't see it and though I can't feel it, I will stand on the word that God has spoken to my heart and I will walk in that word and that's how God got you through that season. Pastors, how many times have you had to recite the call over and over again? I remember when God called me. I remember what it felt like. And right now I feel beat up. Right now I feel abandoned. Right now I feel discouraged. Right now I feel helpless. And you go back and you recite that call. Some of you may go back and recite the call and say, you know what? I've wandered away from the call. God never called me to pastor. He called me to be an evangelist. God never called me to be a prophet. God, God called me to, uh, to be an administrator in the church. God never called me into praise. God had called me into teaching. You see, sometimes we wander away from that call and we're trying to fit ourselves into a region or an area that God has never intended us to be in and there will be no peace there either. But God can strengthen us and encourage us and console us in that finding that call and the things that he's spoken and giving rest to our souls in that moment. You see, there are great benefits to prophecy. Timothy had that benefit. Paul told him, I'm reminding you, remember those prophecies and use them to fight your current battle. Ezekiel was able to preach and teach about hope and life because he saw a valley of dry bones. He saw a field in which everything is dead. He could have been looking at the modern church in the world and he looks around and says, everything's dead. I don't see anything alive. I don't see anything that's resembling of God's character and God's essence. Everything is empty. Everything is devoid of life. We talk a lot about God, but we see very little activity of God. We don't even have altar calls anymore. We tell people to be blessed and we tell people, here's the word of God for you. But when someone's sick, we don't lay hands on them and, and we don't believe that God's going to heal them there in the moment. We say, well, uh, let me know what the doctor says, or well, I hope you feel better in a couple of days. Instead of laying hands on the individual and saying that the lightning of God and the power of God and the anointing of God come in and blast the sickness out of the body and fill them to overflowing with joy and health and let that spring and that light come back in their eyes in an instant. You see, we've lost out on that in the body of Christ today. Ezekiel saw that dry bones, what I would refer to as the condition of the church in this generation. And God asked him the question, can these bones live? And Ezekiel, knowing that God had some other intentions in mind, no doubt said, you know, Lord, I, I, boy, it doesn't look like it to me, Lord, but I know with you, well, you can do a lot of things, but all I see is deadness. See, God needs the prophetic voice in the body today all over the world that would take a look at the deadness in your communities, the deadness in your churches, the deadness in your own spiritual life, and let God answer, ask the question to you, can this life live? Can this community live? Can this church live? Can this, this state live? Can this nation live? And that you would say, you know, Lord, and that God would say, watch what I'm going to do. And he takes a bone from here and a dead bone from there. And he sticks it together, throws some flesh on it and then breathes the spirit of God, a life into there. And what does the word tell us? That as they came alive and stood to their feet, it raised them up a mighty army. That's the army of God that is needed in this generation. That's the prophetic word that is needed in this generation to bring the church back to life. Glory to God. We are people of the spirit. And the Bible instructs us to eagerly desire prophecy. Original Testament, New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Paul says this, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Pursue love. Love is good. Pursue it. Chase after it. Desire spiritual gifts. Those are also good. And above all, that you may prophesy. Would that all God's people were prophets. 
above all that you would prophesy. Why? For the person who speaks in another language is not speaking to men, but God, speaking, of, speaking in tongues. You're speaking to God, not to men, since no one understands you. However, he speaks mysteries in the spirit, but the person who prophesies speaks to people for edification, encouragement, consolation. The person who speaks in another language builds himself up, but he who prophesies builds up the church. I wish all of you spoke in tongues. He's not doing away with tongues. He's not saying tongues isn't necessary in the church. He's saying, I wish all of you spoke in other tongues. But even more that you prophesied. The person that prophesies is greater than the person that speaks in languages unless he interprets so that the church may be built up. What's he saying here? Again, what we were already talking about earlier this evening. He, he is saying, uh, earlier in the session, he, he was saying, here's what's going on. You're coming together and you're gifted and God's spirit is moving through you, but everything is benefiting you. It's how you feel. He says, what does prophecy do? It's in the language of the hearer. And so as you are prophesying, you are glorifying God in a way that they can understand it. You're calling them into account of the things in their heart. You're strengthening them. You're encouraging them. You're consoling them. And that builds up others and not just yourself. Pray in tongues all you want, but don't mistake praying in tongues for spirituality and growing the kingdom. It grows you. It benefits you. And sometimes when you're praying in tongues, you have an understanding of what it is that you're saying. But when it's a prophecy it's not just you that's understanding it it's those that you are speaking it to three things he mentions here that prophecy will do it's not a complete list but it is some of the list for edification in the church edification encouragement consolation edification is building it's construction it's raising something up it's good job that's a, a, an example of edification. It's building someone that says, you know what? You did great in that preaching or great in that sermon, great in that lesson. And I really enjoyed that. Let me, let me lay a, help you lay a foundation there. Let me give you some tools that are going to help you go further with that next time. Let me give you something that's going to help enhance that. And then encouraging someone. That's where you support them. You call yourself the one's aid. You tell them, keep going. Don't give up. Don't be discouraged. It's hard work that you're doing. You can do it. You see, it's not saying this just in the flesh. But when you say that in prophetically, you are saying it as a word from the Spirit. And you're not just saying th those exact phrases please understand me, but you're encouraging them or the Spirit of God is encouraging them by using you. This is what God says. This is what God is seeing inside of you. You continue in the direction that God has called you to. Remember several years ago, I was discouraged about seeing the vision that God had placed inside of my heart to be a part of a genuine move of God. And I was facing a time of transition in my ministry where one area or season of ministry I knew was coming to a close and I wasn't quite sure what the next season was going to look like. And if you serve the Lord for any period of time at all, you'll probably walk through several seasons that may sound similar to you to the one I just mentioned. But I was in one of those seasons several years ago and I remember I was actually out cutting the grass down and uh, I knew an impending move was coming and I was just saying, Lord, I don't know if I got any more of these inside of me and I'm tired and I'm worn out and I, I've kind of been struggling here at, the, at my, my last post of ministry. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm just not feeling the best that I felt spiritually in my life. And, and I remember the voice of the Lord speaking to me so clearly and listen to this, this encouragement, listen to this edification. He told me, he goes, just like in Matthew when the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Joseph and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your spouse. The child that is within her is from the Holy Spirit. And when he is born, he will save the souls of many. And it was the Spirit of the Lord making the instant speech to me and also the instant application saying the vision that is placed inside of your heart is from me. It's from the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to take it. Don't be afraid to be married to it. Though no one else understands it and though it's not something that you've personally seen in your life, don't be afraid to be married to it. When it's born, it's going to save the souls of many. God was saying, hang on, you're going to like the way that this ends. See, that's an encouragement and it came from a prophetic word that the Spirit of God God spoke to me. 
And then those prophetic words will often bring consolation. You see, when you find that right spot, when you find that niche, when things settle down in your spirit before the Lord, you are at peace with God. Your circumstances may not have changed. Your situation may not seem any clearer to you from the external, but on the inside, you can say it as well with my soul. A couple of quick things, and then we'll close for this session. Dr. Michael Brown, on which much of this session has been um, derived from lectures that I've, I've been a part of with, uh, with him or heard from him, he had this to say about the prophets. He said, if the original Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet were completely different things, then the most confusing thing God could have done is call them by the same name. If the original Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet were completely different things, then the most confusing thing that God could have done is call them by the same name. See, I've heard throughout the years that, well, the original Testament prophet, he's gruff, he's short, he's curt, he's, he's rough. But the New Testament prophet, he's love and peace and happiness and butterflies and all kinds of things. And there are common expressions like that that people have with the original Testament or New Testament in general. They think it's two different gods, uh, so to speak, that wrote them. And Michael, Dr. Michael Brown is saying something completely different and the Word of God says something completely different. Why would God call the original Testament prophet and the New Testament prophet by the exact same term if they were completely different things? That would be confusing and God is not the author of confusion. You see, the study is going to show that the call is the same, the mission of the prophet is the same, the anointing is the same, they are endued with power by the same Spirit. This is important for us to realize as the body of Christ, we're called to prophesy and we're trying to get an idea of what that looks like. We can't make it up as we go along because then our flesh gets involved. We can't listen to someone else's experiences because that's not bedrock. It's not foundation and their flesh could be involved. We've got to go to the Word of God and thankfully a quarter of the Word of God, 25 plus percent of it, deals with prophecy and the prophetic. So we have a wealth of Scripture from which we can derive what it is to be a prophet. There is a difference between the lifestyle of a prophet, the calling of a prophet, versus the functional use in the moment of a prophet. Not many individuals, comparatively speaking, are going to be called to the lifestyle of a prophet or calling of a prophet. But would that all of God's people were prophets, there are going to be the multitude within the body of Christ that have functional use of prophecy in a moment. You may not think of yourself as a prophet, but you're going to hear the voice of God speak to you in an instant. You're going to understand it. You're going to yield yourself to it, and you're going to obey what it is, and God's going to be glorified as a result of it. Acts chapter 21, verses 10 through 14. I'm going to speak of one of your favorite New Testament prophets, Agabus. I know that you all, uh, all love and adore him, and you grew up reading all about him. Uh, no, I'm not talking about the little math counting machine. That's an abacus. This is Agabus. This is a completely different thing. So Acts chapter 21, verses 10 through 14. While we were staying there many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us. He took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says. In this way, the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into Gentile hands. When we heard this, both we and the local people begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, what are you doing? You're weeping and breaking my heart. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we stopped talking and simply said, the Lord's will be done. Now I need you to get the scene here. Paul is there. He is on his way to Jerusalem. And we know from reading scripture that this is where he's going to be arrested. He is going to be taken to Rome. He is going to be tried. And eventually he's going to be executed at the hand of the Roman government. Agabus, the prophet, comes into this setting. Okay, and you have to, you have to see the picture. Paul is there and he's saying his farewells and he's talking to individuals and Agabus walks up and he's this prophet and he says, 
takes the belt that's around Paul's waist, wrapping up his tunic, and he ties up his hands and he ties up his feet, which makes him hogtied, basically, right? Uh, and and then, well, they would have called it something different, you know, because, you know, hogs, you know. So anyway, the, the animal tied, and he's, he's laying there on the ground, and he's, he then speaks, Thus says the Lord! The person whose belt this is, you see, the, the, even the language. Everybody knows that's Paul's belt. Why can't you say Paul's belt? This is Paul's belt. But he doesn't say Paul's belt. It's the person whose belt this is. He says, as I am tied, this is the person God's going to, if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be tied up, you know, and bound and delivered into the Gentile hands. You know, and then everybody's like, ah, you know, so they got the message. They understood exactly what's happening. And Paul's like, settle down. He's trying to calm the crowd down. Agabus comes in and he stirs everything up with a word. Was it true? Absolutely. We'll talk more about this in upcoming weeks as well. But I want to, for the purposes of this in this session, I, I want to talk to you about the similarities between original Testament and New Testament. Remember, if the prophet in the original Testament and the prophet in the New Testament are different people, different things with different missions, then the most confusing thing in the world God could have done is called them by the same name. So what I'm doing by reading this passage to you is showing you that Acts chapter 21 and the original Testament prophet, we have similar experiences right here. Similar missions, similar calls, similar behaviors. Okay? What do we have? It says, the Spirit says, in both the original Testament and New Testament, thus says the Lord. This is what the Spirit of God says. So that's a New Testament thing, and it's an original Testament thing. Symbolic actions. You have Agabus taking the belt. Isn't that weird? I mean, for those of you who are wanting to be prophets, isn't that weird? You still want to be a prophet? You want to be a prophet when God has you do stuff like that at work? You want to be a prophet when you have to be that way on the subway or on the bus or on the train? You know, those of you overseas, you want to take your, your yoke like Jeremiah in the Matatu, you know, and try and drive around town? How, who's going to let you on a Matatu with a yoke? Nobody's going to let you on a Matatu with a yoke. They're going to say, well, you fool, you're going to get out of here and you're going to catch something else. You're not getting on here. You're trouble. You know, it's not going to happen. But see, God made spectacles out of these individuals. Ezekiel laying on his side for a hundred and something days in a row, not moving, and then switching over to the other side. And when people would ask him, Ezekiel, are you okay? I mean, have you been laying out in the sun too long? Is, I mean, you need some vitamins. You need some vitamin D or something, Ezekiel. And Ezekiel would respond back, here's what God is saying. Here's why I'm doing this. Jeremiah would take a sash and go and bury it by the river Euphrates, which was miles away. And then later he would go get it and bring it back and it was ruined. And he would say, this is what the Lord's saying about this. See, the prophets did all these kinds of things. You know, the yoke was there and Jeremiah would walk around town with the yoke on. And they would say, the man has lost his mind. But God often would do that with the prophets. He would make them visual pictures of what he was doing inside of them and what he was doing inside of his people. So Agabus has got the same exact thing. He comes and takes a stranger's belt. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and starts taking your belt off in public, I mean, you're going to say, hey, step back, step back. You're a little too close. This is, you know, you know nobody touching the belt here. And, and, and yet he comes up and he takes Paul's belt and then he wraps himself up with it and makes an even bigger spectacle of himself. See symbolic actions in the original Testament, symbolic actions in the New Testament. The prophets in the original Testament had dreams and visions. They were translated, prophets in the New Testament. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. My sons and daughters will prophesy. Old man will dream dreams. Young man will dream. will we'll see visions. Uh, servants, uh, rich, for, uh, rich, poor, slave, free, male, female. They're all going to have these experiences. You see, it's the similar thing in the original Testament and New Testament. It's important for us to understand as we go forward and get an idea of who the Spirit of God is. Because God needs his voice to be heard amongst the cacophony of sin around the world. All of the nations given over to sin. All the governments given over to sin, given over to corruption. Evil is everywhere. And God is looking to his church 
Yes, there's abuses of prophecy. Yes, there's abuses of everything. There's doctors that are bad. There are teachers that are bad. There are, are, are bad public officials. There are bad people in government. But, but you know, you don't stop going to the doctor. You don't stop, you know, going to teachers. You, 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 you don't stop getting... Just because you've had bad experiences and there are crooks and there are charlatans out there doesn't mean that you throw out everything and stop doing those things. Oh, I once had a Matatu driver that, that cheated me and so I'm never going to take a Matatu again. Seriously? we don't do that why do we do that in the church oh there's a prophet and once they were wrong i'm never god even tells us there are going to be false prophets and there's going to be wrong prophets and he tells us what to do about it why should we be surprised and then throw it all out anyway you need to understand that in this generation specifically why do i talk so much about this generation well first it's the generation that we live in so it's the only one that we've got and God has called you to be His voice in the midst of this wicked generation. And that comes by seeing a resurgence of biblically based and balanced people of prophecy. We're going to begin delving into over the upcoming weeks exactly what that means, exactly what that looks like. I encourage you to begin to pray and to study and open your heart and say, Spirit of God, you stir up everything in my life that you need to be prophetic. You, you deposit what giftings you have. You release what giftings you have by the power of the Holy Spirit. And keep in mind, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have some extra tools for you. We have a website. It's going to be omegatexas.church. Omegatexas.church. And we're also going to have an app that's going to be released in the next couple of weeks that you can download from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. It's going to be free. It's going to have these Bible studies on them, plus all the PDFs for the notes and all the handouts that we're handing out here in the in-person services. Uh, you'll have everything except for the in-person prayer that we do after every session. You'll have everything else at your disposal. And with the in-person prayer, just know that we are praying for you. We love you. We're believing that God's going to enrich you, not just in your minds, but that God's going to, going to enrich your spirits and you're going to come alive with the Word of God speaking into your churches and speaking into your communities. It's the voice of God that is so desperately needed in this last hour of time to turn those that are lost back to his heart and to cause them to rejoice again over their father when he says this was once lost and now it's been found and rescued again. God bless you. Please like, please share, and uh, let all of those in your streams and feeds know what's going on so that we can spread this message out uh, to as many people as possible. We love you and uh, we're proud of you. God bless you.